Welcome to the Shaw Award Ceremony. I'm Arun Upneja, Dean of the School of Hospitality Administration at Boston University. And on behalf of the extended Shaw family, which consists of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and of course, our industry friends, I extend a warm welcome to everyone attending today. Today, we are honoring five outstanding individuals. Before we start the ceremony, I would like to take a step back to reflect on why we are honoring them. So the traditional thinking goes that we honor our alumni and industry leaders because we recognize their achievements, their contributions to our school and to our industry. And that's true. These are very accomplished people, but that's not the only reason. We honor them so we can become better. We honor them so we can be inspired to become better. And we honor them so we can elevate the stature of our school. So please listen carefully as Professor Lanz and I make the introduction of the award winners. And also listen carefully to the people we are honoring as they make their remarks. I know that you will be inspired. So for those who we are presenting with our awards today, thank you for who you are, for everything you do in your personal life, in your professional life, for our industry and for our school. <clears throat> so let's get on with our ceremony. Please note that if you want to applaud, the best way would be to shake your hands in front of the camera like this. <clears throat> Today we will award a Young Alumni of the Year two Summit Leadership Awards, followed by the Alumni of the Year Award and our first ever Industry Icon Award. So our award for the Young Alumni of the Year for 2019 goes to Alec Dalton. Alec is an incredible young man. Not too many people know that he served on the search committee that was tasked with the hiring of a new dean for Shaw in the fall of 2012. Until I figured out that he was just a sophomore, I thought he was the ranking member of the faculty. <laughs> so my favorite story is that when he was graduating, most of the faculty and staff didn't know whether to get a selfie with him or give him their resume. I chose a selfie. And given his meteoric rise in Marriott, I've had plenty of second thoughts about that decision. Maybe I should have given him my resume. So Alec is currently Senior Manager of Global Quality for Marriott International. In this role, Alec balances improving worldwide guest experiences while maintaining profitability across all 30 brands. He's responsible for developing systems, tools, and training to help operators enhance the performance of nearly 7,500 hotels in the Marriott system. So when he comes on line shortly, he's gonna name all 7,500 hotels. <laughs> From memory. From memory, yes, of course. Um, in 2018, Hotel Management Magazine named him to the 30 under 30 list for rising hospitality leaders. He has co-authored two international best-selling books, Customer Experience and Customer Experience Two. He's also the co-founder and principal of Hospitality Leadership Academy, a consultancy focused on service quality, leadership development, and human resource management. He also serves on the advisory board of Horizon CX, another customer service consultancy. He has worked at luxury hotel operations for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, Grand Heritage Hotel Group, Ritz Carlton Tyson's Corner, and he has earned many certifications. Certified Six Sigma Green Belt, Certified Rooms Division Executive, Certified Hotel Industry Analyst, and I'm sure many others that I'm forgetting. He graduated from BU Shaw in 2015 with a dual bachelor's degree from Shaw, as well as the Questrom School of Business. At Shaw, he was very active. He co-founded AHLA, he recruited prospective students as Dean's host, and ultimately served as the president of the Shaw of the school's student government. He earned membership in pretty much every honor society, and I'm not going to name all of them. Uh, but he ended, he culminated in BU's esteemed Scarlet Key Society. Upon graduation, he was conferred with the Dean's Leadership Service Award for his contributions to student life. He also serves on the leadership committee for the Mike Oceans Freshman Experience Fund. Please welcome Alec Dalton. First and foremost, thank you. Thank you, Dean of Naja, and to the faculty and staff leading our world-class school. Receiving this alumni award is truly an honor that is deeply appreciated. Thank you as well to every member of our community, each of you 
for your commitment to hospitality education and for your role in advancing our beloved industry. Amidst the celebrations of Alumni Weekend, I don't think it's lost on any of us the challenges that we're all facing in these difficult times. In lieu of sobering statistics, I'll share an allegorical summary of the state of our business. Known for opening our doors to everyone, I've unfortunately heard from many hoteliers temporarily closing their properties who struggled with the ironic reality that most hotel front doors don't even lock. I won't dwell on this though, because as dire as these times can seem, I think we can all agree, the world needs hospitality more than ever before. I may be a Marriott man, but I'll borrow some words once proclaimed by Conrad Hilton. It has been and continues to be our responsibility to fill the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. Thinking of that phrase, the light and warmth of hospitality, I'm reminded of a legendary story often told within the Ritz-Carlton brand, a story that actually takes place on Commonwealth Avenue, hardly two miles down the street from BU. Almost a century ago, amidst the Great Depression, the newly opened Ritz-Carlton Boston struggled to maintain financial solvency. To convince creditors of the stability of the hotel and to assure patrons of its popular relevance, the hotel manager would turn the lights on in every room each night to give at least the outside appearance of stable occupancy. Miraculously, and despite several recent rebrandings, that hotel still exists today. This story resonates with me for so many reasons. First, it shows the creative ingenuity so characteristic of hospitality professionals. Despite the stereotypical white gloves, we're not afraid to get our hands dirty and get a job done. We're go-getters, we're problem solvers. Our light bulbs are going off all the time with bright ideas, even in and especially in challenging times like these. The story also reminds me of the hope that we in hospitality provide to the world. To the Depression era citizens of Boston, the lights of the hotel steadfastly glowing above Commonwealth Avenue must have been a sign of endurance and a promise of better days to come. Today, almost a hundred years later, hotels around the world have been illuminating their rooms each night to form hearts and words of hope. These lights of love brighten skylines around the globe, from Boston to Budapest and from Buenos Aires to Bangalore. That message of solidarity is perhaps best summarized in the immortal words of Motel 6. We'll leave the light on for you. Indeed, that solidarity from and within our industry has been a very welcome reminder that we are all in this together. From hotel chains to restaurant brands and from cruise lines to casinos, with our usual competition cast aside, I have never been more inspired than seeing our industry come together to reinvent itself and to rally as we restore guest confidence in our world. Whenever I log on to LinkedIn, I beam with pride seeing classmates and colleagues, many of you, lend helping hands to others. Receiving this award has humbly reminded me of how many people helped me get here and of how big an impact BU particularly had. To my fellow alumni, equally indebted to our school, I challenge you to join me in paying it back by paying it forward. If you have a job opening on your team, consider tapping a terrier. Lend your talent and guest lecture a class or lend your time and mentor a student. If you can connect a fellow alumni to your network of colleagues, kudos to you. And students, don't be afraid to seek us out. We alumni have a wealth of experience and will happily lend whatever support we can. Just as you followed in our footsteps on ComEv, you'll follow us into the industry. And one day it will be your turn to lead us into the future. And finally, to all of us, Allow me to close by reiterating Conrad Hilton's creed that it has been and continues to be our responsibility to fill the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. Thank you. Uh, that was
very uh, heartfelt message. I appreciate that. And we are, all of us at Shaw are just proud of everything you've done, all your accomplishments, and just can't wait to see where you're headed and where you will reach us. So at this point, I would like to turn um, the mic over to Professor Leora Lanz so she can introduce the award winners for the Leadership Summit. Thank you, Dean Pneja. I want to introduce two very important members of the Shaw community because of their contributions to our school on a consistent basis, but in particular for the Leadership Summit that we were to have had in March that we will have again at someday soon. Let me just share real quickly. I'm, I'm proud faculty member here at Shaw. I'm proud faculty chair of our master's program and evolved into the proud chair of what Dean of Naja had envisioned several years ago as our leadership summit. And it's involved, evolved into something that became bigger than we could have imagined thanks to the contributions of the two people that we're going to acknowledge right now. I want to first share a little bit about Rachel Rajinsky. Rachel is a member of the International Society of Hospitality Consultants, so we're both sorority sisters in that regard. She's the owner and principal of Pinnacle Advisory Group, one of the leading hospitality advisory firms in the United States. She's based in the Boston office. She's got more than 35 years of experience in hospitality consulting. She graduated from the Cornell School of Hotel Administration, started her career in operations, and then worked with the national accounting firm, Pinnell Kerr Forster. Gosh, we haven't heard PKF in a long time, right? With PKF in hospitality and, and eventually becoming principal, overseeing their management advisory service practice in New England. In 1991, that's when she founded Pinnacle Advisory Group. She provides hospitality, operational, investment counseling, advisory services to corporate, institutional, and individual clients on all facets of hospitality real estate. Additionally, she's participated in numerous litigation assignments, providing extensive experience for litigation support and expert testimony. Her knowledge is highly regarded by the industry on a national and international level. Rachel is a board member of numerous hospitality related organizations and societies and is a regular guest lecturer at prestigious institutions of higher education. We are so proud that she's an adjunct faculty member with us here at Shaw, teaching the valuation and feasibility courses in real estate. She's widely published and quoted She's co-editor and author for Hotel Investments, Issues and Perspectives, five editions, by the way, published by the Educational Institute of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Rachel's also certified as an arbitrator and mediator for Hospitality Alternative Dispute Resolution. That's just a little bit about Rachel's professional career. Here's one of many reasons why we're honoring her with our Leadership Award Summit Awards winners. Not only in recognition of her dedication to our school, but we're recognizing Rachel because of the contributions that she had made for the summit that we had had organized for this past March at the Hotel Commonwealth. And while the event didn't necessarily happen, and it will resume as soon as we possibly can make that happen, her determination to bring folks in to participate in our event from overseas to ensure that our students learned from international knowledge because of her experience was admirable. And she was dedicated not only to those individuals that she wanted to bring in to participate, but it was for our students. And that's something that we will always remember. She brought such passion and joy by bringing folks together internationally that I always, and I don't know that I've ever said this to you, Rachel, but now I understand why your middle name is Joy, because a lot of the work that you've done that brings folks together is exactly where that brings all of us. And that's something that we have to acknowledge. I also want to acknowledge the fact that 
Rachel has helped our students in coaching them to compete in STR feasibility competitions last year, and she's doing it again this year as well. This time, of course, it's a virtual competition, but thanks to her knowledge and thanks to her dedication to our students, we're placing our school on national levels with expertise in real estate that she's helping to convey to us. Thank you, Rachel, for your encouragement, your support, your dedication to our students, your advocacy of leadership in hospitality for all of us. And with this, we were thrilled that we are sharing with you our Hospitality Leadership Summit Award. Thank you, Rachel, and we'd love to hear from you. Right. Well, thank you, Leora. And before I start, I want to show you this wonderful award that was sent to my house. And I now need to build a shelf to uh, put it on because it is really beautiful. So thank you for that. So thank you for the award. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for letting me participate. And I just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, first, when I was asked to participate in the conference, I want to let everybody know that I said yes without even checking my calendar, which is not typical of me. I usually have to check my calendar first. But I immediately said to Leora, yes, I'd like to be involved. Let me know what I can do to help. Um, and I, I want you all to know, especially the students on this, on this Zoom, why I wanted to be involved. And, um, and, and number one, um, I knew that this would be a conference that was going to not only educate and inform the industry participants, but it was also going to educate and inform the students. And that to me is a, a great way to have a, a summit. I also knew that this conference would be special um, for a few reasons. I knew the topics would be diverse, which they were. I knew the conference would be small enough, for not thousands of people, but hundreds where we can all work together. I can get to know the people at my table. They can get to know me. I could learn more about the industry participants and also meet more students. And, and to me, that was also important. And also, Leora, I'll throw this one back to you. I knew you were in charge and I knew that and because you were gonna be in charge of this, it was gonna be a great conference because your work is so awesome. And I, I've learned that from being at BU for many years now. Um, for the students, I knew that this conference was going to be learning, but also networking. And networking is so critical to the students' progression and for them to meet people when they get out of school, which I'll talk about shortly. But I, I thought that was important and I wanted to be a part of that as well. Um, I also wanted to be a part of this because I'm a Boston professional in the hotel industry in Boston and BU is in Boston. And I think it's important that we continue to work together. Uh, we're down the street from each other. And I also uh, said yes, because I'm an adjunct professor and I, as Laura said, I do try to do everything I can to help the school whenever possible. So for those reasons, I said yes. I really wish we were able to do this in person and I can't wait till next year's conference or summit, but many of those things were still accomplished. And um, I'm glad that I participated and, and thank you for the invite. I think before I close, I wanted to give some advice to the students because I do understand now that most of the attendees for today's uh, Zoom meeting are students. And I'm not teaching a class this year. This semester, I will be next semester, but I taught last, I teach in the spring. And um, I'm gonna tell the students now what I always tell my students. And it's especially important today because of the pandemic and its impact on the hotel industry, the lack of jobs, the, the, you know, the fact that people are, are, are not happy, the industry is the worst it's ever been, all of those things. But I tell my students the same thing. You need to learn and participate. Participation is so important. Um, in the class that I teach, participation is the number one grade. There's no finals. It's all about participation. And the reason why it's about participation is because I can then have a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-three or one-on-five with students and teach them and learn about them and they can learn more from me. So participation, whether it's in a Zoom meeting or in person, is so critical. And the second important thing is networking. Um, 
I uh, have a son that graduated college in May. He doesn't have a job and I keep telling him every day, it's about networking. And so for the college, for the students that are at, uh, on this call, the hotel industry is a small industry and participate in class, learn, expand what you're learning, but continue to network. And the sum these summits are so important and, and allow the students to get involved and to network. Um, you can call me anytime. I'll call you back. Um, it's really important to see all these people that are uh, speaking today to network and you'll, 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 you'll do fine. It may take a little bit of time, but it is important that you do that. So in conclusion, for the students and for my advice, learn, expand, your, expand what you know and network with industry professionals such as me and the others that are, that are here today. And um, I am very honored to receive this award. I'm thrilled and I really appreciate um, you allowing me to participate today. Well, thank you, Leon. Rachel, thank you very much. I wanna also bestow a second Leadership Summit Award to Mr. Adam Sperling, the general manager of the Hotel Commonwealth. Let me share a few words about Adam's background and his experience and then tell you why he absolutely needed to be recognized as well. Adam also has nearly 35 years of hotel industry experience, including the past 25 years in the Boston hotel market specifically. For the past 12 years, he's been the general manager at the Hotel Commonwealth, and I'm pointing that way because there's Kenmore Square from my office. I can see the buildings. It's a 245 room independent luxury hotel right in Kenmore Square. And during this time as GM, he's overseen $50 million worth of an expansion at that hotel that added 96 rooms and 8,000 square feet of meeting space to the property. Big renovation. In addition, Adams partnered with the Boston Red Sox in 2014 to make the Hotel Commonwealth finally the official hotel of the Boston Red Sox. Previous to coming to Kenworth Square, he's held senior leadership positions at the Colonnade Hotel, the Hotel Tria in Cambridge, where I still think to this day, I think we met because I worked on that project when I was with HBS. Adam held senior leadership positions there and at the Juris Hotel in Boston. He currently serves as an emeritus member of the Board of Directors and is a past president for the Massachusetts Lodging Association, the MLA, and he served on their board since 2001. He was named Outstanding General Manager of the Year by the MLA in 2003, 2013, and 2016. He's also a, currently a member of the Board of Directors for the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. Before coming to Boston, Adam spent nearly 10 years in Chicago with Omni Hotels, Doubletree Hotels, and he was also responsible, responsible for making that famous Doubletree cookie a warm cookie. And that's a big deal because everybody goes to that hotel looking for that cookie at check-in. So that's a pretty notable accomplishment. Adam lives in Reading with his wife, Amy, and their four children, Benjamin, Owen, Rose, and Jane. And now let me tell you why we're acknowledging Adam today. I have to say thank you because the evolution of the Hospitality and Leadership Summit that Shaw sponsors and hosts, which for those of you who may be listening in and are not familiar with it, as I mentioned earlier, this was a vision of Dean Abnaja, which started here at the school and evolved and grew into something much bigger very quickly. And it brought, as Rachel indicated, industry, and students together to discuss topics pertaining to leadership and education for our discipline of hospitality. The summit was something that we were gonna have in March, but we were gonna have it at the Hotel Commonwealth because of Adam. And we have to acknowledge it was a conversation with Adam where we talked about what our goals were with this event, that we wanted to bring this event to become something even bigger than we would have imagined. And without hesitation, he said, I want it here and we're having it here and I will make it happen here and I will get the industry to be with our students here. My pleasure, my hosting, we're taking care of this. We're gonna make this happen. Didn't even hesitate, jumped at the moment to make sure that he could be a part of the opportunity to bring our students from the School of Hospitality 
together with the Boston community and beyond because it quickly became bigger and became nationally renowned and nationally recognized. And it was thanks to his leadership and his dedication and his desire to be helpful to our school and to our students and to make sure that the Boston community recognized the future leaders of our industry and welcomed them right into it. And it was without hesitation that we said, we have to acknowledge this in some way. So while we were doing this presentation virtually and it was supposed to be at the hotel during the event, we felt it was really important for us to still recognize this publicly among our stakeholders and our community. Because without that, Adam, it wouldn't have grown as quickly as it did because you gave us the platform to make it happen. So thank you for that. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to share a few words with our guests who are with us today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leora and, and Dean of Nasha. This is a, a beautiful award. I'm happy to, to receive it, really honored to receive it. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, I, I really and truly jumped genuinely to, to help Shad put this leadership conference on and we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it in 2021 and it will be here. Um, and we'll make it fantastic. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, I think m many people probably know that um, BU has been associated with this hotel since the beginning. Um, uh, BU developed the hotel, opened it in 2003. I was privileged uh, to manage here under BU's ownership for almost five years. Um, and, and that BU is really in the DNA of Hotel Commonwealth. So we, we will always want to be a supporter and a partner with University and specifically with Shaw. Um, there have been so many members of uh, so many uh, Shaw students that have come through here, worked here. Um, specifically, right now, I have two members of my executive team that are Shaw graduates my director of finance and my director of rooms, both Shaw graduates. Um, one of whom worked here actually as a Shaw student, now the director of rooms. Um, so, this hotel is really uh, has supported and partnered with the university from the beginning, and we're, we're proud and plan to do that uh, going forward. Um, I do want to give uh, uh, some advice to, to everybody today. Uh, a lot of it will be very similar to what Rachel just said. Um, you know, my career has really been defined by uh, networking and mentoring. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean and why I think that's important, even though, you know, maybe how I networked and how I, I, I you know, put myself out there 35 years ago is different than you do it today. Um, uh, the importance of that uh, and the benefit to that remains. Um, in fact, my hotel career started really by an act of both mentoring and networking. Um, I was just going to school looking for a part-time job. I had a friend that worked in a, in a hotel setting and suggested that it was a great part-time job. Um, I met with the general manager, talked about the hospitality business. And before that conversation was over, he lifted the phone, called one of his colleagues. And the following day, I was, I was in the hotel business. Um, it was amazing, that's, that's the power of networking, but that individual later hired me, uh, later relocated me from uh, Chicago to Boston, um, and to this day remains uh, my friend and colleague and mentor. Um, he's still the general manager of the Colonnade Hotel today, David Kalala. Um, so my career started that way. Um, he encouraged me to, to, to network myself, to give back to the industry. Um, it, you know, when I moved to to Boston in 1995. The first thing he said to me was, pick a committee for mass lodging, join it and participate. Um, and you know, I can, I can tie uh, three of the other of my fellow uh, recipients today uh, to my ability to, to network and, and, and put myself out there. Um, I've been privileged to serve with Rachel Wojcicki on the mass lodging board for many, many years. Um, I can echo all of the things that Rachel, uh, that Leora said about Rachel as, as being completely true. She is a, an admired and trusted colleague, industry colleague, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm having this, a close association with Rachel due to my mass lodging participation. One of, one of my stops along the way uh, was to run the Hotel Tria in Cambridge, um, and I was privileged for uh, almost the last year of my assignment there. Uh, the Hotel Tria was, was owned and operated by Carpenter and Company, um, which puts me in the company of, of the icon recipient today, Mr. Friedman. Um, that was an honor and I was privileged to be in a, in a few strategy meetings about the hotel and, 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 and really remember some of the amazingly insightful things that, that he had to say about the hotel. Um, 
And then I've always had a, a, a vision that somebody that works for me will, I'll, will someday turn the tables on me and I'll work for them. Um, Alec Dalton is a pretty good candidate for that. Um, Alec was here while he was uh, a, a student at Shaw, worked at the front desk for, for a bit. Um, it was pretty clear back in 2014, 2015 that Alec was gonna do some pretty special things. Um, so maybe Alec, you'll make my, my dream come true of someday having somebody that worked under me be the one I work for. Um, I'll put my money on Alec at this point to maybe make that, make that true. But, um, you know, anytime you can, you know, connect with somebody, uh, network yourself, um, it, do it. Uh, it. Today, in today's world, it seems like maybe there's uh, not the opportunities, but make the opportunities. Um, COVID is going to be behind us at some point. Hospitality is not gone. Uh, and, and, and there is a bright future. Um, that future might not be in October of 2020, but that future is coming. Um, and, and I'll tell you one uh, last quick story about um, uh, mentoring and networking and all that. Um, there was a, a, a gentleman who I got to know through my association with BU, was a professor there. Um, uh, we used to see each other at mass lodging events. We had, we'd have breakfast from time to time at Eastern Standard. Um, and I really, uh, I just learned to enjoy my, my friendship with <laughs> Professor Bloom. Um, and didn't Google Professor Bloom to find out what his pre-BU career was. Um, and so one day he called me and said that um, he was now the chief operating officer of a company that was buying Hotel Commonwealth and he was about to be my boss. Uh, and he's a tremendous guy, um, so bright, so smart. Um, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting lesson to say, um, you know, interact and network yourself with every, everybody that you can, um, just because you don't know sort of where and what that can lead to. Uh, so that is my advice. And, and I'll just finish by saying, you know, a, a really sincere thank you to Dean of Nasia and, and, and Leora and everybody at BU for this, for this honor. Adam, thank you so much. It's our pleasure. And we look forward to many more opportunities to continue to working together, Rachel and, and Adam, um, with our school. So thank you. I'm going to turn the Zoom microphone back over to Dean of Naja at this time to present yet another award to another outstanding alum. Thank you, Leora. And I also want to add my personal thanks to both Rachel as well as Adam. Um, just a very quick story about uh, Rachel. A few years ago when we decided that we wanted to get very serious about adding real estate to our curriculum, um, I knew that without a history of having real estate and without a real estate faculty member, we're gonna have a credibility issue here. So the very first thing I did is I went and looked around the New England region and somehow managed to recruit Rachel Wojcinski to teach at, at Shaw. And so after that, anywhere I went, and I think I must have repeated this phrase dozens, maybe hundreds of times, I would tell people we are, open, we are starting a real estate program and, um, and I would end my monologue with saying, and Rachel Wojcinski is teaching at Shaw. And after that, the magic doors would open every single where that we did. So Rachel, thank you for helping us jumpstart. And we've added a real estate concentration at the undergrad level. And I'm happy to tell you and everyone that right now of all the undergrad concentrations, real estate is the one with the most number of students signed in. Um, so thank you, Rachel. I thank, give my personal thanks to Adam um, just an incredible human being, just does the right thing. Every time I want to get inspired by doing the right thing without any expectation of any honor, name, or any reward, and that's, that's Adam, just does the right thing. So uh, we are truly blessed to have both of these uh, engage with Shaw. So um, at this point, it gives me great pleasure to announce the 2019 Alumni of the Year, and that is our current advisory board member and alumna, Alison Birdwell. Now I'm gonna describe a little bit of her bio, and um, I think the universal reaction I get, and it's, it's in me as well each time, do you really get paid to do this work? It is just so exciting and interesting. She is the president of Aramark Sports and Entertainment. She oversees a portfolio of stadiums, arenas, university athletic venues, minor league 
ballparks, convention centers, concert venues, cultural attractions in both US and Canada. Her clients include, and I hope you're sitting down, a portfolio of NFL teams, MLB, NHL, NBA, and other collegiate teams, which is fantastic, and other high-profile convention centers and cultural attractions. Allison has created a service and results-driven culture and successfully led special events, including multiple Super Bowls, World Series, Final Four events, mega concerts, conventions, and Hurricane Katrina relief efforts. She has risen through the ranks of Era Mark in her 18 years with the company and has been the recipient of so many accolades. She had the distinction of being named Era Mark Sports and Entertainment's General Manager of the Year, District Manager of the Year. She's recipient of Era Mark's President Safety Excellence Award, Era Mark President's Innovation and Safety Award, President's Leadership Award, and Ring of Honor Award. She's on various boards and committees. She was chair of the local host committee for F&B and merchandise for 2011 NCAA Final Four, a member of a Super Bowl host committee, and multiple others. She's very active in community outreach programs and volunteers in many, many um, Houston charities and many other nonprofit organizations. And best of all, we get the advantage of her wisdom and, and all her experience because she serves on the Dean's Advisory Board at the BU School of Hospitality. Before she joined Aramark, Allison worked with Hilton, Marriott, and Wyndham Hotels. She got obviously her undergrad from Shaw, as well as an MBA from University of Miami. And I think, um, I, I'm sure she'll agree that the best part of her is that not only is she a Shaw alumna, but also a Shaw parent. So. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And please give a warm welcome to Alison Bordwell. Thank you so much, Arun. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to uh, receive this award, which is displayed behind me for all to see. So thank you very much. I would like to point out that Alex Award has a word in front of alumni, and that's young. So I'm assuming there's a missing word in front of mine, which is probably old. And uh, for those of you on the phone who are current students, I actually graduated from the program, um, the first four year complete program in, back in 1988, probably before most of you were even born. So that really um, exemplifies the old even more than it should. But I will tell you, Shaw has come an incredibly long way since my time. And um, I got so much out of the program and I come back today and see what it has turned into. And it really makes me proud of um, the school, the um, program and, and the leadership who have taken it to where it is and where it continues to move forward. Uh, we used to be in the 808 building right over the BU Bridge and uh, we uh, did everything in that big space. Yeah, we were part of the Metropolitan College. We didn't even have our own real school um, back then. So it is just so gratifying to, to see everything come to where it has come today. Um, I started my career out, as you heard, um, in the hotel industry right uh, during college and uh, spent some time at the Back Bay Hilton and the Copley Marriott uh, working as part of, of school and obviously to earn some money and really have um, a, a huge appreciation and uh, love and passion for the hotel industry. So getting out of the industry and into what I'm doing now is really shifting gears for me in a, in a very different way. And I just kind of happened upon the opportunity to join Aramark. And I think at the time, just to give you some, some uh, um, kind of uh, relativity to this, Aramark is, is the uh, food service provider at Boston University. And they were, when I was at Boston University, I actually worked um, as a cook in the kitchen at Warren Towers as my first job uh, while I was at, at, at BU. And so it's, it really is full circle today. Um, to ironically now be, you know, have, have established my career with this company that I started out washing dishes and then cooking, uh, you know, slicing turkey tretrazzini meat and stuff like that back in the day at, at Warren Towers. But I think um, from a, a look forward perspective and looking at what we've been through in the last, you know, six, eight months at, at this point, you can imagine just like the hotel industry, how 
um, severely impacted uh, the sports and entertainment industry has been. And we are obviously in a place where we are flexing muscles that we've never had to flex before, make decisions that we've never had to make before. But I can tell you a couple of things. Number one, despite everything being turned on its head and you know uncertainty about jobs and the future of the industry, things will return and I, I know that. And right now, you know, I, I'm going to football games in NFL stadiums where we have between five and 15,000 fans. And, you know, it's, it's just a whole different experience. And, you know, quite frankly, I'm just grateful to have that. So I think we can count our blessings in, in many different ways that perhaps, you know, before I probably wouldn't even have shown up to a game that had 15,000 fans at it. So, um, you know, things, things change and they change quickly. And if we'd said three or four months ago that we'd be having fans in buildings again, I don't think anyone would have believed it. So it's, you know, it's a process and it's going to take coming back. And I think the two things um, that I would really recommend are, are number one, flexibility and all the way from me getting the opportunity to work in this industry and really transferring all the skills I had from the hotel and restaurant industry are exactly how I succeeded. Um, so having the flexibility to kind of see the opportunities as they come at you and reframe maybe some of the things that you thought would happen into ways that you can leverage to things that you never thought would happen or could happen. And, and they, you know, if you told me back in 1988 when I was graduating BU that I'd be in the sports industry, you know, I, I would never have believed you. And so I think, um, you know, anything can happen. I think the second thing is um, trust and trust in that things will come back together. I know I'm spending a lot of time right now with our employees, with our managers, with our clients, and you've got to trust. You've got to trust that, that everyone has, um, you know, the desired outcome and, and we collaborate together. And, you know, it's, it's just a really tough time, but trust and know that things will work out in a way that if you are in the right place at the right time and make the effort, you will end up on your feet. And I think back to what, what Rachel and, and Adam were saying about networking and participation. I will tell you, when I was in college at BU, it was really hard for me to network. It was really um, put me out of my comfort zone. It was uh, easier just to kind of, you know, skirt around it and decide that, uh, you know, if I worked really hard down at the Back Bay Hilton on Friday night, someone would notice my tenacity and, you know, that that's not enough. You've, you've really got to put yourself out of the, out in the world and, and out there in front of those who can help you along. So have the flexibility and trust to do that and know that it does pay off. So um, as we move forward at, at Shaw, I'm incredibly proud to be part of the program. Uh, my son is uh, a junior in, in Shaw right now. And uh, right now he's living in my basement taking his classes, but hopefully that will change in the near future. But um, he is really enjoying his time. He's also uh, one of those many who are very, very interested in the real estate program, which was not available to me, um, obviously in the inception of the program. So it's, it's a great new area of, of the industry um, that is really um, allowing some, some new and different career tracks. So things continue to evolve and grow um, into, into new and interesting ways. So you can flex your, um, you know, your interests and still have a great place in the industry. So um, I am a true believer in Shaw. It's a great program and I'm so happy to be involved again and, and give back in ways, you know, that, that weren't possible before when I was just a student. And uh, I thank everyone, especially Leora and Arun for allowing me to be a part of the organization. Thank you very much. Alison, uh, thank you so much um, for your inspiring talk. Um, I, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, there is a Young Alumni of the Year Award, and I would prefer to use the word distinguished for the other award. So it's the distinguished alumni. Thank you for that, Arun. That makes me feel good. <laughs> um, and, and thank you very much for, all the, for everything that you've done for Shaw and you continue to do, and the confidence you displayed by having your son, uh, son attend here as well. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to announce our inaugural Industry Icon of the Year Award to Mr. Dick Friedman. He has so many accomplishments that I'm awestruck reading his bio, and I feel very humble. I think I probably need to have done more in my life to be introducing him, but I'm very fortunate to have this opportunity. Dick is the president and CEO of Carpenter Company, a nationally recognized award-winning real estate firm based in Cambridge. With the focus on hotel and mixed use developments that span more than 40 years, Mr. Friedman has become one of the most 
respected hotel developers in the country. He's known for his creative approach to hotel developments, reuse of historic structures that I will mention a couple of them, and high rise transformative mixed use projects. So as an example of his noteworthy projects, he converted the Boston's iconic and historic Charles Street Jail into a luxury hotel, aptly named the Liberty Hotel. The design and construction of a 42-story St. Regis Hotel and Residence in downtown uh, San Francisco, and Charles Hotel and Square, an 800,000 square foot mixed-use project in the heart of Harvard Square, Cambridge. It is worthy of note that all of his company's developments have been financially and civically successful and honored recipients of numerous design and civic awards. Just going to name a, a few of them. Development of the Year Award by America's Lodging Summit, Gold List, Condé Nast Traveler, Preservation Award, Massachusetts Historical Commission, and Best Business Hotel from Travel and Leisure, to name just a few. As a member of the Board of Directors of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts worldwide, he's active in its global expansion and design quality. Mr. Friedman's company is currently developing two marquee Four Seasons Hotel and Residential Projects. The Four Seasons in One Dalton Street, Boston, and the Four Seasons in New Orleans. The One Dalton, due for completion in the, um, it's, it's already completed, will be the, is the tallest residential building ever constructed in New England, and boasts bold-faced designers, Henry Cobb, founding partner of P. Cobb, Freed and Partners, um, in 2020, Carpenter and Company will bring to New Orleans its first true five-star hotel, the Four Seasons Hotel and Private Residences. It will be a conversion of the historically landmarked former World Trade Center on the Mississippi River waterfront at the intersection of Poydras and Canal Streets. He's not just restricted to developing hotels in the United States. Currently, his company is constructing a 250-room Edison Hotel in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, set in the harbor in Reykjavik, uh, maybe I'm mispronouncing, adjacent to Harpa, the city's stunning concert and conference hall. Now, he does not restrict himself just to hotel development. Um, he is also known for his long-standing dedication to civic service. President Barack Obama appointed Mr. Friedman to the President's Export Council, where he served as co-chairperson of the committee advising on US travel and tourism policy. During the Clinton administration, he served as chairman of the National Capital Planning Commission, the federal government's urban planning agency in charge of all master planning monuments and parklands in the Metro DC area. He's also the founder of interagency service among other government agencies to improve security with good aesthetics and civic purposes. In addition to all of this, he serves on numerous business, civic, and charitable boards and is a key charitable contributor to numerous local and national charities. It is no wonder that we are honoring Mr. Richard Friedman with the Shah's first ever Industry Icon Award. Andrik Dick Friedman is significant for us in so many ways. First, he's based right here in the great city of Boston and his impact in our local area is tremendous. He has significantly contributed to and changed the skyline and landscape of an international primary market. His developments throughout the US and beyond further emphasize his global impact. His contributions as a citizen of our country to support our nation demonstrate how his vision and knowledge transcends our business sector. He's a true leader and undoubtedly an icon with 40 plus years in the business and still incredibly active. We look forward to so much more. You continue to inspire us, Mr. Friedman. It is our pleasure to bestow PU School of Hospitality's first Icon Award to Mr. Dick Friedman. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, by the way, behind me is a beautiful uh, reddish uh, dish, which reads Icon and uh, Inspiration, Leadership and Innovation. It's not very well lit here, but it's a beautiful thing. And I thank you very much. And I'm very honored by, by this uh, award. Um, at the outset, I'd like to say, I don't deserve the award myself. I've had incredibly great people who are partners and, and uh, participants in our successes. 
Uh, and I only will name a couple people who have been with me at least 15 or 20 years, Darren Messina, Peter Diana, Alex Atia, John Fallon, Riaz Kassim, Gary Johnson, Randy Jack, and of course my family. I will, in this little discussion we're gonna have, I'll try to cut, by the way, the introduction was terrific. I almost don't have to say anything, but I probably will anyway. Um, so going through 50 years of, of my work in just a few minutes is what we're gonna do. But I wanna discuss a few observations and give you a few stories and a little color on what we've done. First of all, uh, I was asked whether I, how, what plan I made for my life and for my career. And the truth is I never made a plan. I have never had a plan. And, but I'm gonna give you some thoughts about that, that will come out as we go forward. One, for you young people, get a mentor or multiple mentors. It's key. Ask for help and you'll get help. Next, one project leads to the next. We're about to start several more hotels and they all come from previous projects that we've done. Associate with great people, especially those people who have aligned interest with you if possible, so you work to the same goal. And Last, I have this odd thing, which is irritates many people. I'm not easy to work with, that I have essentially no distinction between work and play. I like to do business with people that I like, and I ski with them and hang with them and recreate with them, et cetera. And lastly, a, a big point, I try very hard always to make hotels joyous and fun, and not, there's nothing worse than a boring hotel. The next I, little point is that things change and we're seeing that right now so ex drastically, if you will. And expect the unexpected. Don't think things are gonna come back to normal. They'll come back, but they'll be different. And solve problems because all of these projects and all of your projects have challenging and challenging issues. Somebody asked me how I, my career started and I went to Dartmouth College. I was a fairly good ski racer I became the Harvard ski coach after, after that, skied in from a number of international races. And I turned to the retail leasing business and did retail stores. Skiing led me to my first hotel, which was the Hyatt Regency Cambridge. Uh, a very well, a, a, a supermarket, excuse me, a, a department store chain, we called Jordan Marsh, I think now Macy's, wanted to sell the first storage warehouse next to MIT. And I sold it to a very wealthy Bostonian. They said he wanted to build a Hyatt Hotel. I had no idea what a Hyatt Hotel was, but I called Don Pritzker, Penny Pritzker's dad, who was the head of Hyatt. And he said, are you Dick Friedman, the ski racer? And I said, yes. And he said, come on and see me. I flew out to San Francisco, went skiing for the weekend. And before I knew it, we were building our first hotel. Unfortunately, a couple of months later, he passed away on the tennis court in Hawaii. And his father, A.N. Pritzker, took over the his, and he called me up and said, I'd like to come see you. I got this file for my son. A.N. Pritzker was an amazing man and my great, my great mentor. Uh, all of you, please, please, please try to get a, a mentor and admit what you don't know and don't fake it. Well, following the, the Hyatt Regency Cambridge, and we really didn't know what we were doing, AN sent me to Texas. We built a hotel in Texas, Princeton, New Jersey, et cetera. We built a number of hotels. In fact, next year, we're going to open another hotel in suburban Boston with Hyatt. So we have a 50-year relationship with Hyatt. After that, we went on to build the Charles Hotel in Harvard Square. The Charles Hotel was the former site that Pre President Kennedy picked his Memorial Library. Next slide, please, if you would. Um, and it was a competition with 28 firms and three finalists and we won uh, HFF and, and H, now JLL helped us get a partner. Interest rates were 20%. We financed the property at 13%. My mother begged me not to do this. We got sued seven times, but we stuck with it. And it has was refinanced many, many times, like 15 times before I, we, I and I bought out various partners in the project and then I brought, I, I became partners and thought, I, partners, uh, I flew to Cleveland and met with Bill Gates's representative and they bought an interest in the hotel and we've been partners for 15 or 20 years in a great partnership. And it's a great, great thing to have a great partner and Gates has been a tremendous partner for us. 
for this company called Cascade. They subsequently put me on the board of directors. Arun, I got to correct one thing. I went off the board earlier this year uh, at actually a pretty good time because I didn't have to deal with this COVID mess, which is quite the mess. Around these times, we started to build the, uh, the, fan, the airport hotel. Darren Messina did most of the work and we built the airport Hilton. Uh, and, but then we took on the fan pier in, in downtown Boston with, with the Pritzkers. And that project was a great vision of how the, how the city of Boston would expand uh, at, over the Fort Point Channel. And it was 10 years in the making. It ended in a massive lawsuit. And uh, we won that lawsuit and eventually we sold that piece of land. That's a sad part of our, that we didn't get to finish that project because we would have been doing a fantastic thing. We took on a competition subsequently in San Francisco and we won a competition to build what is now the St. Regis. Nobody knew what a St. Regis was. They only had one hotel in New York with butlers. So how do you transform a hotel uh, that has a tradition of formal, fancy, but all those sorts of things into a, into a modern hotel? And at about that time, we had 9-11 happen. And we had to, on, due to our deal with the city, we had to keep building it. And for about three or four years, we put one brick at a time up. And, um, and that's, you know, we just kept going, but it was very slow. Incidentally, as I told you earlier, one deal leads to the next. While I was working in San Francisco, I met a young lady um, out there whose name is Kamala Harris, and she was an assistant DA. And we've been friends for 20, 30 years. I hope she's our next vice president. We'll see. Another big game changer in my life was the fact that I met Bill Clinton. I met him in 1988 at the Democratic Convention. I was in Governor Dukakis's suite, and he came in. And I subsequently, I used to look, and I still do, at who's the guests at the Charles Hotel. Guest recognition is one of the most important things in the hotel industry. Everybody wants to be recognized. I've had billionaires call me up and say, hey, just make sure they recognize me when I go to the Four Seasons in London or whatever. So one day I was looking at the guest list for the Charles and I see Governor Bill Clinton. And I, I called his room and I said, Governor, we met, at the, we met several years ago. Any chance you'd like to have a beer? He said, sure. And then he said, Dick, I'm going to run for president. And uh, will you support me? And I said, no, because I was supporting somebody else. At any rate, Bill Clinton became a great, a great friend and mentor of mine in a certain way. I'm older than he is, but a great friend. And when he became president, I invited him to stay at my house in Martha's Vineyard. And he did that for nine or 10 times. We had Bill and Hillary became great friends. And, and once we were, we were there, he was in the backyard of my house and we were sitting down talking about, he actually was asking me how he could get a mortgage when he was no longer president. And I, that's, that's easy for me to discuss. And he said, would you like to be in public service? And uh, I said, I'd love to be in public service. He said, well, why don't you run the National Capital Planning Commission? I said, well, there's somebody else in that job right now. He said, he won't be there on Monday. So I took on that job. Um, at, we, did, we then went and developed somewhere in the early 2000s, the Liberty Hotel, which is now called the Liberty, was the Charles Street Jail, a very punitive place and a very horrible place. It was closed in 1990 by federal court order for cruel and inhuman treatment where three prisoners were in each cell, which was eight by eight or something like that. I fell in love with that. And the, the big development issue there was how to figure out how do you make a joyous place out of, a, out of a horrible place. One of the more fun things in the stories I did, everybody thought the place might be haunted. And somewhere along the line in my career, I became uh, friendly is the wrong word, but highly acquainted. Um, actually also through the Pritzker family with the Dalai Lama. And I became friendly with, the, with some of his monks. And we had a great, we had a great experience in the, in the, in the uh, jail before it opened of having what's called a fire puja with a bunch of monks ch chanting and, and things. And, and they had fire there and the fire department came. It was quite a scene to have a, a, about 
eight or 10 Buddhist monks in saffron robes um, uh, chanting. But we seem to have driven the, the uh, spirits away because that has become one of the most successful hotels occupancy generally over 90% for, for the last 15 years that it's been open. More recently, we took on One Dalton. We won a competition to develop One Dalton and, in, and also ties back to the Pritzkers because Penny Pritzker, uh, who's the, the daughter of Don Pritzker that I started with, uh, was Secretary of Commerce subsequently. Uh, they, they joined us in a, in a bid with the, from the Christian Trans Church and she suggested Harry Cobb as an architect. He's one of the greatest architects of the world and we've had a great experience in working with Harry along with Gary Johnson of Cambridge Seven in developing uh, the second high, highest tower in residential tower in New England and the third highest building in the city. And Alan Leventhal, who was chairman of Boston University, joined me as a partner. He's been an incredibly great partner and is actually my partner also in New Orleans. And the Four Seasons, people say, well, how come you build a Four Seasons? I said, well, the, the, there were very few cities, I think eight in the world that have two Four Seasons. And we got permission from Four Seasons to do it, the owner. And actually the owner of the existing Four Seasons became a partner of ours. And he's also a partner of ours in New Orleans. So that project has been very successful. We've paid off all our debt. We have record uh, sales prices for you know, much, much higher sales prices than any condominiums in the, in the city. The hotel is doing quite well, notwithstanding COVID. Uh, and it has been an incredible experience for me to change the skyline of the city. I hope for the better. And when I, when I drive around and see it, I get quite a thrill. Uh, it'll never be done again by me, at least by me. And uh, sometime a little after we started that, I was in Florida with, uh, with Bill Gates's uh, right-hand guy on the hotel business, Randy Jack. And Alan Leventhal called me and said, any chance you could come to New Orleans and see a site? We've got an interesting site. It's a historic World Trade Center that had been closed for decades. And Randy and I immediately went to the airport and flew to Florida. So one little, one little thing I would say is act fast. Do it now. Don't hesitate. The deal that lies, dies. And so that will be the second largest Four Seasons uh, in, in the world with 100 condominiums. Uh, we're going to announce in the next few days, some very exciting people who've bought there, some real celebrities, and that will open next spring and really be a big addition to uh, the city of New Orleans, which desperately needs a great five-star hotel. In, 19, in 2008, or thereabouts, I've got my years messed up, President Obama asked me to be co-chair of the President's Export Council, and tourism is an export because it means money coming into America from foreign countries. And on that, on that council, was headed, the council was headed by the chairman of Boeing, or CEO of Boeing, but another a fellow named Arnie Sorensen, the CEO of Marriott, was another co-chair. And he and I were on a trade mission in uh, Poland, trying to build Polish uh, people to come to America a lot. And we were there and he convinced me, I he said, what are you gonna do in Iceland? I said, I'm gonna build a W hotel. He said, don't do that. I, why don't you build an addition? Of course, subsequently he bought W, but we, we, he said, okay, I'll, I'll help you do this. And uh, just a fun little story about this. We're in negotiations on a management agreement with a very miserable female lawyer who worked for Marriott. We were down at headquarters. The d discussions were going dragging on and on and on, uh, hour after hour. And about 12 o'clock on the second day, we were in this conference room. I was very frustrated. And the, uh, the door opened to the conference room and in walks Bill Marriott and Arnie Sorensen. And I don't think this, this lawyer had ever met either of them. And he said, how's it going? I said, well, not so well. We're just fighting about eminent domain provisions and all kinds of minutia. He said, well, it should be done by five o'clock. And he walked back out and we got it done by five o'clock. So <laughs> that's just a little sidebar story. Expect the unexpected. Uh, a little bit about the Boston market to close, to close what I'm going to say. Uh, the Boston market today, and I'm not, Ra uh, Rachel Rajinsky's much more of an expert than I am on these things, and I'm also a client of hers. 
Uh, the Boston market today is one of the worst markets in the country. Uh, it is really very challenging in Boston, but Boston is a great hotel city and will be great again in different ways. All of the, all of the things that Boston had going for it are in disarray right now. It was a great convention town. It was a great sports town. It had enormous student energy and population, healthcare tourism, an amazing airport, and constrained supply. All of those things are, in, are being challenged today. But I believe that this is a great time to invest in Boston. I think Boston is one of the greatest cities in the world, and it, and it, will, it will come back. It won't come back the same. It will come back different. Some of these, cha some of these changes in the economy and the hotel industry are forever. Some technologies will change. Group meetings will change. But Boston is a, don't give up on Boston because I think we have a very bright future and, and the hospitality business and there'll be great opportunities. And you, are, you young leaders here are the change makers and I think you should just go for it because it's gonna be a great time and as soon as we get through this election and through we get through COVID and through this recession and those things will happen sometime in the next, well, soon. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have. I'm not shy. Thank you so much. Dick, thank you so much. That was so inspiring to listen to your stories. It was incredible, all the projects and all the experiences you've had. And uh, we just can't wait to see what is in store over the next few years. Um, I know that you will have many exciting projects as well. But one of the pleas that I have is I hope that you continue to be engaged with the BU School of Hospitality Administration. We are an international school of hospitality, but firmly entrenched and part and parcel of the uh, Boston community. So I hope you will remain uh, engaged with us. So at this point, I would like to throw it open uh, to and, and turn it over to Professor Lance uh, for any questions that anyone might have had. Professor Lance. Dick, someone wants to know if you've been traveling at all during this time, if so, where to for the projects, or if you haven't been traveling, once travel opens up, where will you travel to for the first travel? Well, I have um, the good fortune of having two planes. So I have been traveling. I came up this morning from Martha's Vineyard, where I've been mostly for the last few months. Uh, so I travel back and forth to the vineyard, but I've also been up to Iceland a few times in the in post COVID. I've been to California. I've been to Colorado. I've been to Texas. I've been to New Orleans. I've been to Charleston, South Carolina. And we're working on projects in all those, all, not all those places, but almost all those places. So I do think that um, uh, I, I've been on one commercial flight. I flew a commercial flight from Iceland back to Boston. There was nobody for 20 rows in front of me or behind me. Uh, I'm not afraid of travel because I think it's relatively safe, uh, but the public is going to be afraid of travel for quite a while. So I, I, um, uh, it's in my blood and it's in everybody's blood who's in our industry and, and the public and people are going to are sick and tired of being home. So they will travel again as soon as, uh, as soon as we get a vaccine. There's a few more questions actually, Dick. Someone has asked if you foresee travel uh, if you foresee hotel growth along the south and or north shores of the Boston area, do you see continued hotel growth there? Um, I don't know much about that that subject. I would I would say my ge my general uh, opinion is that with enough hotels in Boston, there's a ch there's a need for some different kind of hotels than we have. So I'd be optimistic about conversions of things to more lifestyle hotels, more youth oriented hotels, but I'm not, we are doing a hotel in Braintree uh, right now uh, with Hyatt. Um, it is, it, but in general, I'm not really an expert to tell you the truth on suburban hotels. That may be better post for Rachel at a different day. Um, Dick, there's another question here. You mentioned Hyatt, you mentioned of course your relationship with Four Seasons. Someone wanted to, to know if was there a brand or is there a brand that you particularly enjoyed working with? Um, might be easier to work with, uh, less easy, or is there a brand that you haven't worked with yet that is on your pipeline? Well, we've worked with almost all the brands, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, 
uh, Four Seasons. Uh, we haven't worked with one and only or some of the five star mm -hmm. luxury brands that are growing. I'd like to do so. They're very interesting brands. Um, to tell you the absolute truth, I love most independent hotels because we don't get a big thick rule book of what we have to do or not do. Although in the Four Seasons world, they trust us and they let us do, they have standards of course, but they let us, they don't dictate to us the color of the wallpaper and, the, and those details. Some of the hotel brands are so anal and pro prescriptive that it's not much fun to develop them. They're sometimes good to own, but they're not fun to develop. We've got, someone wanted to know if your family is involved at all. Do you have other family members involved at all in some aspects of the business? Um, my family's not involved at all. And I think that, uh, I think they've seen how hard I work and they probably decided to go the other way. So <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> I, I have two sons. Uh, one, is, one is a commercial fisherman uh, and teacher. He lives at Martha's Vineyard. And my, uh, my, my second son is a, um, uh, is a student at Harvard, virtual student living at home studying. And my wife, uh, my wife likes to travel. And by the way, when we first went on the, on the Four Seasons board, she was giving me a, a little grief about why you're doing this, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I took her to Paris to a board meeting and we were in the George Sank, which is one of the greatest hotels in the world. And we were in a huge suite. It was about 50,000 euro a night. She said, don't you lose this job. But um, she's not terribly involved. She's supportive, but not terribly involved in the business. Okay. Uh, someone else is asking here, working in various governmental capacities, um, how did you, was it challenging, uh, harder than the development work that you had? Any sort of uh, stories to either share about uh, learned lessons from those experiences or opportunities that you might be interested in the future even to support? Well, I've, I've always, I mean, it's not, not a secret that I'm a big D Democrat, although I do support some Republicans. Uh, I think it's an honor to be in public service. I've enjoyed what I've done greatly. Uh, we, tried, we tried very hard in the Obama administration to increase the number of foreign tourists. It's quite a significant problem how we're treating people at the airport, hassling them and making this country unpleasant to come to. We somehow give, we somehow, when you go to China, you get a 10 year visa. When you come from China to US, you get a two year visa. We had terribly bad policies uh, 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 on tourism. And it was helpful, really fun to try and solve those problems. And the National Cal Planning Commission was a real joy as well. This was after, mostly after 9 11. And we tried to figure out how do you secure things. So I've enjoyed it greatly. Uh, I have no plans to do anything. Uh, in the in the public sector, uh, I continue continue to work. But I, if called upon, I think it's a responsibility to serve the public, even if it's just on the board of some of a school board or, or a board of selectmen or an advisory board or a hospital board. I think those of us who've had a had a good life in America uh, ought to ought to give back to the public sector. And I think there's a trend today not to do so because the polit political environment is so toxic. But Hopefully that will change in a couple of weeks time. And actually there are a number of questions coming into me about the election. Not that we wanted to get political because we don't, but I guess it's a matter of how do you foresee the hotel industry or the travel bans, which you actually just did allude to. Um, there's a number of questions coming in about that. How do you see the hotel industry potentially changing after the election or how will it impact the hotel industry? Well, it will take a while. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, all kinds of, all kinds of people that I know want to come from Europe or from lots of places to America can't come and we can't go there. So the, this, this is the, the, the lockdown is very serious. I actually am one of those people who believes that we should lock down further, get this thing over with and get it behind us. That we are in a situation, my assistant's sitting here wearing a mask right now. That's not a good thing. I'd rather, I'd rather, we've got to figure out a way to defeat this, this, uh, this, this virus and get on with life. And um, I don't think that, uh, I don't, I don't think that it's going to happen overnight, but I think, I think face, basically, I think we have a, another nine months, maybe a year of bad road. And I think people, young people will start to travel first. Our hotel in Iceland, people are dying. People in twenties and thirties 
are dying to go to Iceland. They all want to go there. So it will, it will come back. I, I will note that in, when I look at the occupancy, and Rachel would know more about this, resort hotels are doing very well because people want to get away. They want to go to the warm climates. They want to go. I think New Orleans is kind of a resort hotel. Iceland is. Urban hotels are going to be slower to come back, and the group meeting business is definitely going to take a few years to come back. Thank you for that, Dick. And then I had, it looks like just about one or two last questions about, you mentioned current projects. You mentioned there's another Hyatt coming to the Boston area. Um, it sounds like New Orleans is also still in uh, the works. Do you have multiple projects? Is this typical to have multiple projects going on at one time? Do you have more that you're hoping to consider down the road? What's on the lookout for Carpenter and Company? Well, we, we um, when projects get in the last six months of construction, I don't really have a role. I mean, I have a bit of a role in, in uh, telling the managers what they did wrong and uh, doing stuff like that. I'm being facetious. Um, but so we, we are starting other projects. We're looking at a couple other places to build. And by the way, people said yesterday, someone said to me, how can you develop a hotel during COVID? I said, what's the perfect time to develop? Because when we start a hotel today, we're not talking, we're talking about what the world is going to be like in three to four years from now. And I'm positive, very positive and upbeat that the world in three or four years is going to be much better than it is today. So we are looking at more things. Also, frankly, money is very cheap and construction costs are coming down a bit and labor, labor regulations are coming down a little bit. So I think it's a very good time to develop more, more things and selectively because you just can't build any old thing anywhere. Uh, there's a lot of hotels for sale, and those are great opportunities too, especially to convert things from one use to another. Dick, thank you. And just lastly, and you you've had you have shared some terrific words of wisdom with our students, particularly, don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Don't fake it um, and and get a mentor. Is there any last thoughts that you have before we wrap up? to address to the students who are among us. There are some faculty here, there's some industry friends and colleagues, there's some friends and colleagues, of course, of all of our award winners today, but for the students who are here, any thoughts that you wanna share because you have given us some good inspiration for the future of this business, despite what we're going through right now, we're gonna get through this, but anything you'd like to share? Well, I, I, I'll just sort of repeat what I said, which is that uh, I have some people that have worked with me over the years that they're in their 20s or 30s and they think they have the answer they don't know too much uh at being old which i am i actually think that each has wisdom so I, I i like it when people don't have all the answers and they come and they say how should we do x y or z uh, a lot of people think they got a degree from harvard or bu or or cornell or something that they they know a lot uh and they really don't and but older people who've been successful want to help young people so I think one of the great lessons of, that I could impart to people if I had a lesson is ask, ask for help and you'll get help. And if you uh, try to fluff up your resume, I love it if someone comes to me and says, I don't know anything about this, but I work my butt off. That's a good thing. So I, um, I, I like it. I like, to, I like to be a mentor and it's fun. I had more fun being the Harvard ski coach than I did being a ski racer myself. So coaching is, is a great is a great thing. And I think everybody should have a coach. And uh, I have a life coach right now, actually, someone who's helping me think through issues and business problems, et cetera. And I talk, I, and she's mentoring me. I mean, she's young, much younger than I am, but you're able to talk to somebody who knows a little bit more about some things than you do. So don't be too proud. I think that's a great way to conclude our conversation with you, Dick. Thank you so, so much. And congratulations on our first Icon Award. And Dean Abnage, I'm going to turn it back to you to, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Friedman, thank you so much for your inspiring words. And um, it is very, very um, interesting to hear from you. Um, it's, it's no wonder that you have all the honors. And we are particularly very grateful that you agreed to accept the honor from us. Um, I also have to let you know that I was listening to you very carefully and I heard you loud and clear that you have continued interest in doing public service and serving on boards. I think at our school, we would truly, truly 
um, looking forward to all the guidance we can get from senior leaders. So I expect to hear from me soon. Uh, <laughs> all, all the other awardees, uh, thank you very much for attending and thank you for accepting the award. I look forward to being in touch with, with all of you. Um, and to everyone who's here, um, thank you for joining us in this celebration of industry greatness. Uh, join us tomorrow for two very, very intriguing conversations. One of them is a look at the global hospitality landscape from regions of the world less covered by the media and interesting uses of hospitality real estate at this time. The first one is being moderated by Professor Lanz, and the second one we have a moderator who is also an alumni, uh, alumna of Shaw. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Have a great rest of the evening and a great weekend. Thank you.